Thank you, Zoe, and thanks to all of you who are participating in the webinar tonight. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm going to be talking with you about Ayn Rand, Christianity, and the journey to find common ground that, that I find fascinating and enlightening. I've been reading the comments on the SFL page that uh, describes this talk, and and I got to tell you, I'm, I'm encouraged by the the passion and the engagement that many of you have for this subject. Most of the comments, uh, I have to be honest, were, were against the very idea of comparing and contrasting these two worldviews. In fact, adherents of both worldviews have raised objections to even having the conversation. And I'm still not sure, as I reflect on it, who would consider this topic more blasphemous, Ayn Rand herself or the Apostle Paul? But nevertheless, here we are exploring what I call a conversation between Christianity, represented in this picture by St. Patrick's, uh, Patrick's Cathedral, and Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, represented by that 40-foot statue, iron statue, outside of Rockefeller Center. This is a scene with which I'm familiar because... I used to walk by this scene at the corner of 50th Street and 5th Avenue uh, in Manhattan daily as I went to work. In fact, my company's building is in the back right. You can see it in that picture. Um, and, and this scene is just very familiar to me. This is also a scene that Ayn Rand would have been very familiar with when she lived in New York City. And for me, this scene has become a metaphor for the conversation between Ayn Rand's philosophy and Christianity. And we'll see this scene, um, you know, this sort of metaphor coming up in the talk here tonight, and I hope you'll come to uh, at least appreciate the richness of it. Tonight we're going to talk about The Soul of Atlas, the title of, the, of my book, uh, what it's about and why I wrote it, We'll talk about four questions through which to understand any worldview, not just Christianity and objectivism, but any worldview. And then within Christianity and objectivism, we'll talk about four ideas that we can compare and contrast from the perspective of each of these two worldviews. We'll explore common ground and there's uncommon ground, but we'll explore both of those at least uh, to some extent. And, uh, and of course, we'll look at how we can engage more deeply in this conversation beyond this webinar and time permitting I expect to take your questions. So let me look first of all at the soul of Atlas, Ayn Rand, Christianity, a quest for common ground. The soul of Atlas is a story, the story of my personal journey. I, I encountered these two worldviews throughout my life and and it's a story of how I, I was engaging with each one through my two fathers, respectively. The conversation that played out in my life through my two fathers was more, I would say, than an intellectual exercise. Um, it was really a passionate, intimate uh, conversation that was colored throughout by my circumstances and my dysfunctions, really. So I commonly get the question, you know, why did you write The Soul of Atlas? And I think there are a couple of good reasons. The first reason is that the two worldviews have affected me deeply and personally, and the, the passion for this conversation grips me. It, it's just played out in my own life, and I'm, I'm sort of compelled to go after it. Um, I think the reason of broader importance, and particularly for this webinar, is the profound influence that these two worldviews have had on Western civilization at large, and particularly on the existence or the, the, the founding of the United States. While Ayn Rand may not be at the top of the typical citizen's list of philosophers, she is she has contemporized the thinking of, of Aristotle and other philosophers who have followed him for the post-industrial age. She's lifted up reason as the basis for the life that is appropriate for human beings in a civil society. Christianity 
has motivated men and women throughout history to live and act on, on absolute principles that have guided our, our Constitution and the system of laws that we have in this country from the beginning. And now, by common ground, I'm not talking about compromise. I want to make that very clear. I'm not assuming that agreement can exist at every point, and I'm not assuming that we take some third middle ground. I'm seeking areas where each worldview holds values in common, deeply valued truths that are valued by both. And I do that, I want to show you sort of the, the inside of the Soul of Atlas, just to give you an overview, table of contents is divided into three parts. Um, the uh, table of contents, uh, you can see it a little bit better here. Um, in the book, I divide the presentation really into three parts. The first part is the background of the story, my story, really, how I got to the conversation and some insight into the characters and the context of the conversation between these two worldviews. And from the beginning, even for those who have no understanding of either, either worldview, either Christianity or objectivism, I present each worldview in the voice of the man himself, the adherent of that worldview. John articulates his own and Ayn Rand's philosophy, and Dad speaks about Christianity and his convictions, which are, you know, one and the same for each of those two men. Moving through each of the topics that you can see here, sex, money, capitalism, etc., the soul of Atlas, you know, I sort of recreated the dialogue that I had with each of my fathers on a variety of topics. And in the end, I've found common ground in places that perhaps you may not even guess. What I'm really talking about here as, as each of these worldviews is represented is, is, is sort of a C.S. Lewis meets Ayn Rand. And, and Dennis Miller interviewed me. You can see the interview on my blog, soulofatlas.com. And he asked uh, about a post that I'd made that same day. It was entitled, Ayn Rand Meets C.S. Lewis. And that, that hypothetical meeting really characterizes the conversation that takes place in my own life and, and that I want to take place more often among thoughtful people from each persuasion. And so let's take a look more specifically at each one. John represents objectivism. Uh, in my story, he he represents Ayn Rand's philosophy to me, taught me about Ayn Rand's philosophy, while most of my colleagues, friends, or neighbors were going to church or synagogue. My family was worshiping in the pages of Atlas Shrugged, and uh, you can see sort of John here, uh, the sort of a montage that that characterizes his life or the salient points that I bring out in the book. He's an entrepreneur. He's the CEO of Cybex International. It's a fitness equipment manufacturer. You can see uh, he's pictured on his diving board on the left uh, in a profile for Forbes magazine. He's a movie producer. Driven by his passion for Ayn Rand's philosophy, he has made the first two uh, movies in a trilogy of Atlas Shrugged. The posters are at the top. Um, Atlas Shrugged Part 3, the third part, is coming in 2014, as you can see in the top right. And uh, there he is on the top left with Harmon Caslow, another producer of, of that trilogy. He's also a poker player, you can see in the bottom left. He uh, won the U.S. Poker Championship in 2004 on ESPN. And uh, there he is with a cigar uh, at the premiere for Atlas Part 2. And, uh, and, and there I am just sort of wondering at all of the activities that he's doing and how his philosophy intersects and influences his entire life. In contrast, Dad represents Christianity. And Dad is a different person altogether. He's a farmer. Uh, even that word farmer doesn't capture the textbook portrayal of a, of a farmer today. He is a PhD, a teacher, a business school professor, now retired. He's a, a fitness enthusiast. He is also an, a, an author himself, and he is a passionate Christian. 
Now, in brief, to understand any worldview, but these two worldviews in particular, I do what I, I portray here as sort of speed dating for understanding worldviews. So I ask four questions of any worldview. What is the nature of reality? What is the individual's highest value? What's wrong with the world and how do you fix it? And how does each worldview, in this case, uh, Ayn Rand's objectivism and Dad's Christianity, how do they answer those questions? Well, for, for John, for Ayn Rand, the nature of reality was primarily existence exists. And, and reality is primarily impersonal in the sense that there is not a divine personal force that is guiding uh, the, the existence of existence. Whereas dad's answer to the nature of reality is that everything begins with God and the person of God. He's a theist and so he believes in a personal God at the heart of the universe. The individual's highest purpose, John would say, it's his or her own life. Dad would say it's relationship, in particular relationship with God, rightly understood. What's wrong with the world today, John would say at the heart of it, and there's a lot to this answer, bad philosophy. People don't understand reality or an individual's highest value, or have any worldview that they can articulate that's internally consistent, etc. Dad would say, at the heart of what's wrong with the world is alienation. Not only alienation from each other, but alienation from God. How do you fix it? Well, John would say rational self-interest. Dad would say redemption. Those are loaded words, but as I walk through the description of each worldview in one father or the other's words, they unpack that and have explained that to me and, and sort of led me through the thought process of not only answers that they've given, but also to ask those questions. So let's look at some dichotomies here. The the sort of uncommon ground, if you, if you will. Um, you've got atheism, theism, selfishness, sacrifice, egoism, altruism, money, poverty. These are big discrepancies or big, you know, sort of back and forth conversations. But in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on one, and that is selfishness versus sacrifice. Well, what is selfishness? And you, you may be familiar with Ayn Rand's use of this word. And what she really is um, uh, talking about and her, her sort of key component of her view of selfishness is that um, rational self-interest. Now, she used the word selfishness. I think she meant to be provocative. It certainly is that. But she didn't have in mind the, the idea of being rude or antisocial or disruptive or unkind or whatever it is that we remember from, from kindergarten that we were told to avoid. Um, she, she talked about rational self-interest and she believed that one's own life is valuable. In fact, it's the highest value and that a virtue is anything that sustains and enhances that individual's life. In contrast, you've got sacrifice. And Ayn Rand had a uh, way of presenting this idea that, that sacrifice, a sacrifice is an act of subordinating something of greater value to something of lesser value. Now, I'd submit that this definition is maybe not in line with our contemporary or maybe even Ayn Rand's contemporary understanding of the word. And, and I'll give a couple of examples. So when I subordinate my temporary enjoyment of um, some rich dessert or the other, strawberry shortcake, in order to maintain my health and fitness. I'm definitely foregoing something. I'm, I'm sacrificing something that I value, that is the taste of something sweet that brings me pleasure, for something that I want even more, fitness and longevity. 
when I uh, sort of opt out of a relaxing day of reading in order to play with my son, I'm sacrificing something that I value, rest and relaxation, for something that I value even more, my son's pleasure and development. And uh, so the alternative is sort of the operative definition that I use, that is foregoing a lesser value to gain a greater value. So what's really at stake here is not um, is not the distinguishing between selfishness or sacrifice in 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 uh, the Randian sense of those terms, but but um, as Pascal said, all men seek happiness, even the man who hangs himself. It's not that the the one worldview supports happiness and the others against it. The disagreement is around how one achieves happiness. Christians and objectivists differ at that point. So John is convinced that it's by focusing on himself, his own soul, his own life as an end in itself, uh, that he can practically achieve happiness. Dad is persuaded that God is the supreme occupation of his life and his being, and he says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so, make no mistake, each man is passionate about pursuing that which he believes will generate the most joy for his soul. So that's an example, and there are many more in the Soul of Atlas, of how each worldview approaches a key aspect of living in this world. Now let's uh, move on here to common ground. And I would say that there's some likely common ground, there's some unlikely common ground, and it's really a, sort of a three areas that come to mind off the top. And I think that both objectivists and Christians miss these a lot of times because we get so caught up in the legitimate differences that we ignore the more obvious commonalities that, that should not be taken for granted. So first, there's, there's philosophical common ground. Both worldviews share the philosophical uh, foundation of, of objective reality or, or truth with a capital T. There is truth and, and the, that truth can be known. The world we live in presents itself in ways that are knowable and can be investiga investigated. And, and there's, there's common ground in that both worldviews agree that the humans have a capacity to reason and that that capacity to reason is essential to our, our identity and uh, to our, our capabilities. There is, there is furthermore meaning at the core of our experience as humans and our political ideologies reflect what we see as meaningful as well as relate to how we reason. So there is philosophical common ground. It doesn't extend the whole gamut of each worldview, but those are the elements. There's political common ground. My fathers agreed on limited government. The government does have a role, but it's not as expansive as, as many people today uh, are espousing and throughout history, history really, um, make it out to be. It's not, um, I should say that Ayn Rand believed that government has a role, uh, and that is defending individuals from criminals at home and abroad. It's not controlling the means of production. It's not distributing wealth. It's not being a benefactor to the people or a, a parent to all citizens. But the government does have a role. Now, each father comes to this conclusion from a different foundation and a different thought path, but make no mistake, each of my fathers comes to the conclusion of limited government. If you ask John, my stepfather, the, the secular libertarian and Rand follower, why he espouses this role, he would say that this role of government supports and encourages individual production. It supports and encourages innovation, and and it supports the the creation of value by individuals. 
if you ask dad, he would say that the government is not the benefactor of the people. And by overreaching, uh, in other words, playing that role of benefactor of the people, the government is usurping the role of the church in our society and depriving uh, individuals who, through their own choice, seek to help others as Jesus did. So you can see each father comes to the same conclusion, but from very different reasoning, very different uh, foundation and pathway of thinking. So there's philosophical common ground, there's political common ground, and the third one that I have on this slide is economic common ground, and that is capitalism. Again, each father comes to a similar conclusion, yet they're coming from a different foundation and a different way of thinking, different line of thinking. If you ask John why he espouses capitalism, he'd say, well, because it recognizes the need for man to produce. Uh, and what they're producing is to sustain and enhance their own life. Capitalism supports that. It makes room for that, unlike any other economic system. If you ask dad, he would say that capitalism is the economic system of choice, but he would say it because it's the only economic system that makes room for humans being inherently selfish. So socialism, on the one hand, depends on everyone being inherently altruistic, and in, in a socialist system, when people prioritize their own interests over the collective, a totalitarian regime comes in to enforce the system because people are acting in an inherently selfish way and throwing the whole system into disarray. So, so we've got three areas, really, of common ground, philosophical, political, and economic. So in light of this common ground, what should we do? And the soul of Atlas really comes at this with a fourfold process or offering in four steps. The first is what we may be starting here tonight in this webinar, and that's engage. Get in the same place and start talking about these ideas. The second step after you've sort of gotten into a conversation is to listen with a view to understanding the other worldview, to be able to articulate, to understand so well that you can articulate that other worldview in terms that are acceptable to the adherents of that worldview. That's what I did with my fathers. I had to understand where they were coming from, but then really understand to the point where I could articulate that in, in my own words to their satisfaction. And it was only after that I understood that I could begin to reconcile. And I'd submit that it's only after we each understand the other that we can begin to reconcile, to find common ground. And I would say that we must, because the opposition to deeply held values like individual liberty and personal responsibility and what we've talked about tonight, limited government and capitalism, and, and I might add, the way Christians and objectivists understand these values. The opposition to these deeply held values is substantial. So we must engage, understand, and reconcile so that we can do number four, which is act. And I would say act together in order to take our country back. So where do we start? Well, as I said, I hope we've started here tonight with this. But in order to engage in the conversation, my intention is to really introduce the conversation with the soul of Atlas, um, but then to start provoking thoughtful discussion, thoughtful conversation. And there are a lot of opportunities um, to do that that you see on the screen. There's Facebook, Soul of Atlas, um, facebook.com forward slash Soul of Atlas. There's uh, Twitter, at Soul of Atlas. Um, in the lower right, you can see there's uh, YouTube, there's Pinterest, there's um, LinkedIn, etc. cetera. And, and most of all, there's uh, soulofatlas.com where I'm 
trying to bring new content and keep going with more and more um, uh, discussion of various topics that affect us all. And, and of course, you can read The Soul of Atlas, and I hope you will. So thank you very much for participating in the webinar tonight. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined, and uh, I would like to hear your comments and your questions. So I will turn it back over to you, Zoe. Thanks.